are the parts of the teachings that you find hospitable in the minds of your students and what teachings do you find are challenging for your students? Well, the concept of jihad, uh, this idea that, that is, is there a justification in Islam to, to go out and kill people, um, that's a difficult concept, obviously, for, for people in this country to deal with. So I want to I want to take it, you know, straight on. And I do it by looking at how did the Prophet Muhammad actually fight? Most of the time, Muhammad was seeking alliances. Um, he was persuading people through his moral message. And by the end of he was eight years in exile. At the end of that time, without any military victories, any sizable military victories, he came back to Mecca with 10,000 followers and there was not a single drop of blood shed. Do you believe there's this conflict between Islam and modern feminist ideology? I would say in my view the answer would be no because ultimately in all of the signs and ayahs and verses of the Quran we are taught that despite which nation and tribe God created you from, despite what gender you are, in the end the only thing you'll be judged for is your righteousness. That is the leveling force. Your submission to God, your duty to family and uh, community is the first criteria. I don't see any of it at variance with um, women's rights or with uh, feminism. I wanted non-Muslims to appreciate the, the power of this journey and the universality of the journey because all of us really in our faith quests are looking to know God better we're looking to know who we are and what's our purpose in being here on planet earth and how can we improve our circumstances and that's part of what this quest is about and i think people could relate to that and how have you been able to take that powerful optimistic hopeful strength into an america post nine eleven which has had so many destructive misconceptions about islam well and i knew that one thing that I can do when I learn from the tradition of my grandparents and um, people in the 60s that when you're faced with adversity the one thing not to do was to face it again with violence mm -hmm. that we could just take a step back assess what's going on and try to work to change that work in whatever way you can as the American Muslims and law enforcement officers what we do um, we started Girl Scout troops for example in Brooklyn we've enrolled over 120 girls in Girl Scouting. Girl Scouting is about service to God and service to country. What better way than to be involved in Girl Scouting, to show American Muslim girls that this is their country and they own it just as much as anyone else. Um, they have a duty to report terrorism. We taught them that. We spoke out at different messages, letting people know if they were afraid to come forward, if they knew something, they can come to us and then we would in turn report it. We've sponsored um, information fairs where Muslims um, within the Brooklyn community were put in contact with various government agencies, local, state, and city, and the services that these agencies provided. We sponsored basketball tournaments for children. We think that just interacting among each other will help to allay a lot of fears about Muslims just through simple interaction. You don't necessarily have to sit and preach and teach people your doctrine, but by working with them on a daily basis, by them seeing you, yes, that... I completely agree. I think the example of personal courage and kindness is, is what it takes to overcome prejudice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people saying, well, how could I be prejudiced against Muslims after 9-11 when I have a friend, so-and-so, exactly. who I know is a decent person, who I know is a loving person, who I know loves America, I can't, I can't make that step. It was only those people and, and not Islam and not Muslims. Exactly. That's the key. Right. This idea that, that I love about Islam, that, that really the animals just have animal instincts, the angels have no animal instincts, they're more like God, and we're in between. And it's really a struggle because our animal instincts for adultery, for greed, for murder, those are the instincts that draw us away from our spiritual nature. And I think Ramadan is one of the greatest creations of all world religions because it is an entire month of great sacrifice that brings immense spirituality, tremendous sacrifice and charitableness from Muslims. And, and I think it's one of the great creations of, of our Muslim brothers and sisters. 
Yeah, fencing has been the driving force in my life. I was able to get a, a scholarship to college. I went to NYU, mm -hmm. uh, graduated with a BA in economics, and now I'm involved with an organization I'm very proud of. I'm the co-founder. Uh, it's called the Peter Westbrook Foundation. Tell us about it. It's a not-for-profit organization that utilizes fencing uh, to enhance the lives of kids both academically as well as athletically. Uh, we meet every Saturday from 9 to 12. We have kids, boys and girls, in the program from 9 to 18. We we'll provide uh, free tutorial help. We give them the opportunity to fence. We provide all the equipment, uh, essentially free. Uh, wow. We're sponsored by various organizations, and, and I'm really proud of that. We, have, we put three people on the Olympic team in 2000. We're slated to put another four on the 2004 Olympic team. A lot of our kids are you know, college-bound. have students in Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard. Uh, you know, when Tom and I first got together, people thought, well, it's really very strange to have a Catholic station to have a rabbi on. And now, because of your tremendous help and because of the, the wonderful, wonderful people at the Islamic Center of Long Island, uh, we now have a new direction in telecare that also expands the understanding of telecare and its service to the community and that is the wonderful program called our muslim neighbors and let's talk about the program and first of all how it began and, and what ideas you had about helping people understand more about islam well it was really father tom's initiative when he came and we had a little chat and he said what he's watching on television isn't what he knows about the Muslims of Long Island. So let's put a real face on television. So it was really putting a face of the community on television. And uh, during the last year or so, we've done a remarkable amount of work. We have had already six different segments done. I know, I know. And the kids, the kids have been here, the adults have been here. We had a show on you and uh, Father Tom came to the mosque, walked through the mosque, asked, answered so many questions. And yes, and we co-host uh, every one of those sessions. And I, I tell you, uh, I've studied Islam and I've learned a great deal, and it's been a wonderful experience. And first of all, I want to thank all of the people who have helped us, uh, it's just wonderful people. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a great experience for us. The, the staff here, Mike and Chris and everyone else, yes. have been so supportive, so helpful. We, we felt at home. That's wonderful. And, you know, I felt the same thing when I first came here. I was a little unsure at the beginning. After all, it is a Catholic station. But because of Tom, really, and his vision, his inclusive vision, uh, there's room here now for, for Jews and Muslims. And I, I'm just so thankful that he's been able to do this and so thankful that I've been able to play a part because, you know, obviously the tensions in the Middle East and the tensions in the uh, war on terror have made it very difficult uh, for the Muslim community. And, and what we really want to do is to, to help address the simple truth that the only way that prejudice can gr grow is out of the soil of ignorance. Absolutely. And once people know that, that Islam is a wonderful religion, once they know that uh, they're Muslim, uh, neighbors are their neighbors they're, they're, they're boys and girls and, and men and women who want the very same thing that everyone wants and, and who believe in a world of peace and justice and, uh, and who believe in the same God that we all believe in and, and once everyone understands that I really think that, that prejudice and discrimination will disappear uh, Rabbi, the beauty of this United States is that here's you and I are sitting in a Catholic <laughs> studio <laughs> and talking about, talking about uh, our commonalities. I yeah. mean, where else can this happen? Nowhere. Well, next, we meet another Long Islander known for keeping the faith as a physician, a teacher, and a spiritual leader in his Long Island community and around the world. I'm so glad that Dr. Khan is being profiled because not only as an American citizen or as a Muslim or as the president of the Islamic Center of Long Island, but just as a great individual. And he is a great role model for all people and all types of walks of life. He was never just a doctor or just a community organizer or just a father. All those roles were always intertwined. 
I've had first-hand opportunity to work with him and his trainees to see that he was a, a wonderful and inspiring teacher and an excellent clinician and you know he's he, he is a real physician who's made significant fundamental uh, clinical research contributions to the field of pulmonary medicine. Being the youngest he was the favorite uh, in the family and my father and mother had a lot of uh, affection for him more than uh, I think all of us because he was the youngest. When I came here in 1966 my wife and I had made a pact basically that we would get our training and return to Kashmir in five years. Well now it's over 40 years. <laughs> The question is, why didn't we go back? It was basically the political situation in Kashmir, which was uh, responsible for our staying here, and staying here by choice. Because even my dad wrote to me, he says, don't come back, because the situation here is so bad that your talents will be wasted. Stay where you are, do good, and you'll be of great help to the larger community. We have been married for over 38 years, and our marriage has been a very happy one. Farooq, you have been a very kind, caring, loving, and compassionate husband, and I thank you for that. We join with the whole community in giving credit to Dr. Khan for his belief, for his heroism, and his leadership. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your story. God bless you. Dr. Khan is a member of our college foundation and a dear friend. One who invited me to his home, of course with his wife, for a wonderful dinner upon my introduction to Long Island. I embrace him as a brother and I salute him in his great work at lifting up the Muslim community and fostering better relationships between his community and all of us here on Long Island. The faith I represent, which is the second largest in the world, is a faith of peace, which has been hijacked uh, by extremists, and we want to bring back the uh, message of moderation and tolerance and mutual respect. Living in North America, where there is so much miscommunication, misinformation about the Muslims, that it behooves us to go out and explain ourselves. And from that emerged the very strong outreach program that we have with synagogues, with churches, with multi-faith forum, and uh, you name it, whoever invites us, we go in and present ourselves. The response has been very gratifying. And invariably what happens is when people come in and spend some time with us here, and they say that, gee, there's so much in common between us as individuals of different faiths, then there are differences. And so we try to stress on the commonalities of the faiths. This center has been very warm, not only to me, but to all individuals who come here from all walks of life. Whether they be Muslims, whether they be non-Muslims, it, it doesn't make a difference. And that's the beauty of this community to me. The diversity, uh, the outreach, uh, it's, it's just something that I think if every community could experience this, the world would be a lot better place to live. So let's join hands and work towards the same goal. Um, and he's made that possible. Where other people were skeptical of coming forward, he had no problem with that at all. Uh, it saddens me when I go overseas and see the very poor image which our country has. You go to any part of the world, you'll know that Coca-Cola comes from the United States. But they will not know the greatness that exists in the United States how so many different communities and societies and cultures are able to work through and, and, and live together in peace and harmony. This is a message which needs to go out to the rest of the world. So each one of us in our own ways can help get that message across. I do a fair amount of writing, I do a fair amount of traveling, I want to share what I have learned with as many people as I can. I want to help bring a lot of people and train them here and expose them to the great country that we have here and help them go back to the countries they come from because the uh, United States, in my view, is the greatest country in the world. And we have a lot to offer, but we need to share it. We cannot be isolationist. We need to have a little broader vision of our society. And that will be beneficial for everyone. Khan 
Brown is one of those people who defy age. Now, he'll tell you that he doesn't have time to worry about that. He came to America as a young man to study medicine, and he never left lucky for us. Dr. Khan is a renowned pulmonologist, and he led the research team that discovered the drug Cipro. He raised his family right here on Long Island. At the same time, he helped raise a community in faith. As one of the founders of the Long Island Islamic Center, his life's work now is to build bridges across faiths and communities. And Dr. Fruit Khan, I am delighted to see you again. It's a pleasure to see you again. It's been a little while since we've talked. You've been traveling. We should tell people you're from Kashmir. Right. You've been home. Yes. It's your other home, your former <laughs> home. And where in the Middle East and to do what? <clears throat> I'm currently in Riyadh consulting and helping develop a research center at the King Fahad Medical City, which is a, a huge medical complex made of four hospitals and a medical school. And they asked me to come out and help them develop some recent new research initiatives. In, in making those uh, connections, now I know they see you as an American, that, which gives you an opportunity to hear a lot. Talk to me a little bit about the impressions you got from what they're thinking about us these days and, and the kinds of questions they're asking you in Riyadh. Uh, sadly, the perception about the United States <clears throat> is, in my view, at an all-time low. And, of course, the current issue of Iraq is on the minds of everybody. And does it seem to have gotten larger over the last year in your travels? Yes. I mean, as, as even more pressure uh, to talk about? Uh, yes. And what the common person is saying, how could a country as great as the United States be making such decisions which don't make any sense and uh, creating more problems in the process? And our difficulty is we haven't been able to export our goodness, the softness, the great educational system that we have, the great health care we have. What is the problem with our inability to do that? And, you know, we love blaming the media. We love saying, oh, they're not telling the good story. So let's assume that that may be part of it. Are there other uh, things that keep us from preventing uh, to tell the good stories about it. It basically boils down to our focus on the conflicts, the military conflicts, Israeli-Palestinian, Iraqi issue, and all the hot spots which seem to be concentrated in the Muslim world. And uh, what the people are seeing is the military side of our effort, the guns, the airplanes, the bombardments, and that doesn't go too well. Because people say, you know, you, you tell us that you're coming here for this reason, but that's not the truth. Okay. The weapons of mass destruction and all that stuff. It's very hard to have a conversation when there are guns uh, as part of it physically. You were talking about um, uh, Kashmir mm -hmm. before we began this interview, and I asked how much it had changed, and, and you said the same thing. Now you see guns there. Once you get this gun culture into the society, it turns everything upside down. Uh, the respect, uh, the, the norms of society, and whoever has a gun calls the shots. Do you have any sense of how we can begin to work our way out of this? Yes. By taking some complex, unresolved issues and using our might and muscle in bringing the groups together and helping them come to a resolution of the problems. A reinstitution of diplomacy? That's, <laughs> that's usually what it's called, diplomacy rather than military uh, muscle. We have tried for four years. We are worse off than we were four years ago. Let's take the idea of talking to each other in diplomacy and transplant it and bring it home here to Long Island, to the New York area. And I said to you when you came into the studio today, oh, Dr. Khan, I saw <laughs> your picture in the New York Times. I felt so proud. I said, I've, I've met this man and, and loved talking to him. In that picture, you were meeting with the imam from... Uh, Harlem. Uh, yes, from Harlem. Mm -hmm. And it was on the heels of the dreadful, dreadful fire in the Bronx where some children from Mali yeah. died. Talk to me about what your experiences were during those meetings? Uh, you see, we have such a diversity of cultures. We have a large group of Muslims who grew up, were brought up in the United States. And then there's a large group that has come from overseas. And their cultures, their background, their thinking, although they have the same faith, is very different. And how to bridge that divide, how to get closeness, and how to overcome these stereotypes which we have about each other, that was the whole idea of that long conversation we've been having with uh, Imam Talib and from the Harlem Mosque. Does it seem to you that it's harder to have those conversations now than it was, say, a decade ago or two? You've done this for a long time. Yes, I think it's the challenges have become more post 9/11. 
the, the focus is greater, the challenges are greater, uh, particularly for the Muslim community because we are under a cloud of suspicion and any time anything bad happens, it, almost the focus is directly on them. So under those, in that environment, it's, it's tougher. But you know, we say when the going gets tough, the tough get going, so. <laughs> and, and lest we sound uh, too pessimistic, your life's work in this area has been bringing people together and, we, and I, getting people to talk to one another. It's very rewarding. Yes. Very rewarding to see the results of our efforts, be it with the Jewish community, the Catholic community, the Afro-American community. Uh, we have led the way in, in trying to get the groups together, in having them talk to each other, meet each other. And when you sit face to face, you know, we all have the same issues. To what extent do you think some of the problem is that we seem in the past couple of decades in teaching children to value history so much less than we once did, that how much of it is literally not knowing anything about the other person's culture? Which is so true. I mean, if you look at the Europeans and you look at the Americans, we are miles apart as far as knowing about other people. And, but now it is changing for the better. Now even my fellow citizens in the United States are curious. They come to the mosque, they ask questions. Great. They, so it's changing. It's changing for the better. It's going to take time. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. But the work has started. And uh, my suggestion to everybody is, you know, knock on your neighbor's door. Get to know them. Introduce yourselves. And you'd be amazed how these stereotypes break down so rapidly. Let's talk about where people get their information. You know, we are in such a transition here, whether it's, it's people who no longer go to libraries or they go to libraries <laughs> for different reasons or they don't no longer read uh, newspapers. Where do you think people ideally should get the best combination of information to get accurate information? Go to the source. I can tell you that in our Islamic Center of Long Island, we have had large groups of people, the elder hostelers, the schools, the college groups, they come there and they spend a good chunk of time and ask some tough questions. So they get directly information from the source. Once you put you know, the, the sound bites and try to explain everything in a sound bite, you lose a lot. So my suggestion would be, if you have a question about a Muslim, go to the mosque. If, and you go ahead. And, and, and ask them. Put them on the spot about terrorism, about suicide bombings, about belief about other uh, Jews, Christians, all the things that are kind of perpetuated on some channels. Uh, you need to get the real information from the horse's mouth. But at least start the dialogue keep the dialogue going, whether it's here on Long Island or across the world. That's the key. All right, where, where, when are you off again? Uh, <laughs> within a couple of days, I fly back to Saudi Arabia, and uh, my goal there is to uh, give them an exposure to the great research that's going on in the United States and develop linkages so that they can benefit from what we have advanced in and we can benefit from what they have to offer. Absolutely. So it's a two-way street ways. and I'm acting as a bridge. So <laughs> perhaps we should uh, chat again about this time <laughs> next year. As we say, inshallah, God willing. Inshallah. And uh, Dr. Farooq Khan, a delight to see you as well. My family. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, I'm Rabbi Mark Gelman. And I'm Father Tom Hartman. We're the God Squad. We're the God Squad, and we're about to grow. Uh, what we're doing is very exciting to both of us. And you know, Tom, it began really because of the vision uh, that you have brought to Telecare and that has been endorsed by the leaders of, of this diocese of um, Bishop McGann, may his memory be blessed, and Bishop McHugh, may his memory be blessed, and now uh, Bishop Murphy, and that is without losing sight of the fact that Telecare remains a Catholic television station, that it has a spiritual and moral responsibility to help people understand about the other religions in our midst. Our friendship was the first step in that. Well, 17 years ago when we first met, we not only became friends, but we recognized that we both were interested in the Word of God, that we wanted people to grow closer to each other and closer to God. In the course of our travels, we've met many Muslims. We've come to admire many Muslims, learned some fundamental things about the Koran and how they pray and, and what a mosque is all about. But we feel as though we don't know enough about our Muslim neighbors. So we have a special show that we're developing. That's right. And, 
not only is it important to understand all the what we call the Abrahamic faiths, all the faiths that trace themselves back to our father Abraham, which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but also we have a particular responsibility during these times, uh, these difficult times, when so many people misunderstand Islam and connect Islam with the horrible, horrible outrage of terrorism and do this unfairly and cruelly and make the lives of our Muslim brothers and sisters difficult. What we believe is the average Jewish family, the average Christian family, the average Muslim family have basically the same questions. That's right, and we want to put a human face on a religion we don't know enough about. So we're going to begin the journey with this program. We're going to go visit a mosque and we're going to learn about how they pray, learn a little bit more about the Koran, why they take their shoes off, and many other things. We're going to be joined by our good friend, Dr. Farrow Khan. We visited the Islamic Center on Long Island, and we just wanted to thank everyone there who was so kind to us and so helpful in producing this series. Let's take a look now at our visit to the mosque. Welcome to the mosque, Rabbi. Good to Welcome see you. to the mosque. Thank you. Let me take you inside. We're now entering the area of the mosque where we have to take off our shoes before we enter the mosque. This was a big deal for me. I had to find a pair of socks with no holes in them. Why do we take off our shoes? It goes back again to the teachings in the Quran. Uh, in the Quran, in, uh, there's a very clear verse about this when Prophet Moses. Yes, we have that in the Bible. Yeah, he's brought in the burning bush. He's facing the Creator. He says, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes, kneel down and prostrate. Because you are on holy ground. You are on holy ground. You are above the valley of Sinai. You also have a washing. I remember at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, there was a, a fountain Absolutely. just for washing feet. When we are entering the, inside the mosque, we are in the presence of the Creator. Mm -hmm. We want to be mentally prepared and we want to be physically clean. So we leave everything earthly outside. The shoes, we wash ourselves, you'll see the area of the ablution, so that mentally and physically when you're inside the mosque, it's like you're facing the Creator. As far as the dress code is concerned, yes. we basically need to be dressed modestly, which both of you gentlemen are, and for the women, it's expected that their heads will be covered during the uh, inside the mosque. What is the name of that covering? Hijab. The hijab. the hijab. And we see Muslim women wearing the head covering and it's really a whole long... Well, the, garment. the Quranic injunction is dressed modestly. Now, depending on your cultural background, you can wear a decent uh, sh a blouse and a, and a skirt, you can wear a, a Arabic dress, you can wear uh -huh. shalwar kameez, that the culture determines. But the bottom line is you have to be dressed modestly. And when you're inside the prayer area, uh, both men and women have to dress mod uh, modestly. And for the women, it's expected that they will have their heads covered. Mm -hmm. I went to a convent. You know, I used to see my teachers, my nuns, in hijab all day long. <laughs> right. And one of the things that we do in Christianity is we encourage people on Sundays when they come to Mass or to a service to wear good clothes because it's a special service and to be modest as well. I notice particularly Pakistani men and other men, very beautiful uh, embroidered caps. caps. caps yeah. But that's also, as with this, this is a custom. This is not a law. Yeah. You don't have to wear this. See, Does it I, can, represent the I can take of it God? off. Yes, I could take it off and not be struck by God. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I better put it back on. But uh, it's just a custom. So. So it really it depends on the Muslim tradition. Tradition, right? traditions, yeah. Because traditions. you don't wear a... We don't have, for example, you know, a collection of caps out here that you have to enter the mosque and you put on a cap. Only women. Only women. If some countries you go to, you will see that in some countries. Really? A yeah. cap? Place. A cap available for all the men to put on. Well, I was in Istanbul and I decided to go into a mosque. And taking the shoes off reminded me that I was doing something special. And when I walked on the floor, I was walking gingerly, and it made me more prayerful. 
Now we are in the wash area. And uh, before going inside the mosque, we prepare ourselves by cleansing ourselves physically, both our hands, our face, our mouth, and our feet. And this is the area of the ablution. What are the steps of preparation? Basically, uh, a physical cleanliness, which is done here, and a mental preparation, that you're entering the mosque area, you need to be in that frame of mind that try to leave as much of distractions outside as possible. This, uh, I've seen before, these places where you sit down and then you wash your feet, and uh, it's called wudu. Wudu, ablution, cleaning, yeah. This is, now, you have a baptism, which is a, a form of ritual we, initiation. We have baptism in which there's pouring of water, mm -hmm. and you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But when you walk into a church, there's holy water, and you, you put your, your hand into the water and you make the sign of the cross, which is a renewal of your baptism. It's hmm. interesting, and in our tradition, we have mikvah, which is a ritual bath used primarily by Orthodox women and also for conversion, and sometimes on other occasions, which is a full body immersion. But other than that, uh, so really a washing is part of all the traditions, but really a preparation. preparation. There's no significance to the washing per Preparation se. to be in the presence of the Creator. Well, I like the idea that you said the inner cleansing too, getting your mind ready yes. for prayer, for the Quran, Absolutely. for Allah. Absolutely. We are joined now with our, uh, for this wonderful exposure to Islam by our friend, uh, Dr. Farooq Khan, the president and spokesperson for the Islamic Center. Farooq, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank you. great to have you. And again, uh, thank you to all of the people at the Islamic Center for making our visit there so incredibly important for us and so spiritually enlightening. I can't tell you how excited we are to have this opportunity to be with our friends and neighbors, Christians and Jews, and basically take them through a tour. What goes on? Clear up some of the mystery, some of the myths, some of the stereotypes. A walk through the mosque. Why do we wash? Why do we pray the way we do? Why do we face Mecca? Why, the way the mosque is structured? And these are kind of, unless you go through it, it, it becomes like uh, the unknown. And sometimes there's a fear of the unknown. Doctor, when I went through, I got a sense of the sacredness. Uh, taking my shoes off made me slow down. Walking into the mosque itself and seeing people pray, I noticed a tremendous devotion to the Quran. I must admit I've never read the Quran. I've read parts of it, and I'm anxious over the course of doing this show to learn more about the Quran, what's in it and what's not in it. Absolutely, and I would encourage all the folks to pick up a Quran and just with an open mind, read it. One of the things I wonder when I, I came to the Islamic Center is, of course, uh, the huge diversity of Islam. People think of Arabs as Muslims, and of course, most all Arabs are Muslims. But most Muslims are not Arabs. Absolutely, Rabbi. Only 18% of the world's 1.2 billion Muslims come from the Arab world. and. Uh, Unbelievable. In our community, the Islamic Center of Long Island, we have at least 30 different nationalities represented. Hmm. It's like United Nations, Africa, hmm. Asia, Middle East, North America, South America. Well, that's a, that is in itself a tremendous tribute uh, to the Islamic Center, that it's able to bridge those cultural differences. Absolutely. These cultural differences, while they are great opportunities, they also bring challenges. Sure. Because when you put in 30 different cultures together in the mosque, and trying to have them develop a cohesive kind of, a, of an outlook is a challenge. How do the children react to this? Are they able to bridge these differences children more are, than the adults? Absolutely, absolutely, mm. because they're growing up in America and they have crossed that barrier. They don't bring in the cultural baggage with them. Well, we have a surprise later on in one of the shows. The children came to telecare, yeah. and they're going to ask us some questions. But when we return on Our Muslim Neighbors, we'll show you more of our trip to the mosque. So stay with us. Welcome back. Farouk, that is a beautiful mosque. Congratulations for creating a community that could build it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one thing I wondered, but we didn't really have a chance to follow up enough I, uh, uh, when we visited, is the role of children in, in prayer. I'm very, well, all of us are very interested in, in the spiritual life of children. I wonder how you integrate children in the prayer service that we saw. 
we encourage the families to bring the children as early as possible. In fact, when you see a large gathering, you might see infants screaming and crying during the prayers. So my, my view of this is the children shouldn't even be remembering the day they walked into the mosque. It should be part of their growth. They should be right from the beginning be brought to the mosque and grow in the mosque and see what it's like. And you don't have any problem of them disturbing the service? We are setting up now a place where they can be watched so that the others don't get disturbed during the service. Let's continue with our visit to the mosque. We are entering the area of the prayer. This is our mosque at the Islamic Center of Long Island. And as we're walking, we are walking in the direction of Mecca, uh -huh. the Qibla. As you can see in the front, we have uh, mihrab, we call it mihrab. That's where the person who leads the prayer will be standing. And all of us are facing towards Mecca. And uh, the carpet, as you see, is designed in a way to make it easy for the congregants to stand in lines so that the lines are straight and they know which direction to face it. And interestingly, this carpet was made in Georgia. Dr. Khan, one of the first things that strikes me is that the room, by comparison to a church or synagogue, is stark. Why is that? When we are inside the mosque, we are in the presence of the Creator. And we want to minimize any and all distractions. So therefore, you will not see any decorations on the walls. You won't see any pictures on the walls. It will be as simple. The tone of the paintings, the color will be earthly, will be toned down. To get that kind of mental tranquility that you're really in communication with the Creator and nothing outside is going to distract you. Yet I do notice a little writing in many mosques. The two symbols on the mosque, one is Allah. Which is that? which is the Arabic word for God. Mm -hmm. And uh, in English, we say God. In Arabic, we say Allah. It's the same God for everybody. And on this side, we have Muhammad, uh, who we believe is the final and the seal of the prophets. Mm -hmm. In many mosques, as you pointed out, Father Tom, we have inscriptions from the Holy Quran, basically some particular ayahs and surahs, which are written in a very nice calligraphic manner. And uh, they basically kind of bring you again closer to the message of the Creator. You know, Tom, in, in a lot of ways, this is very similar. And the idea of a, of a simple a prayer place without uh, images is very similar to the laws that we follow in Judaism. Well, I noticed that when I went to your synagogue. Yeah. And the reason for us is the same thing, the focus on God, you shouldn't be distracted, but also the fear that we would violate the commandment against uh, graven images against depicting something in the second commandment or your first commandment. And so we would not generally have in a synagogue and certainly not in a mosque pictures of, of people that might be considered a graven image. But a, a verse from the Holy Scripture in both a synagogue or a mosque decorating the walls would be very common. Whereas in Christianity, one of the first things you notice is a cross. Jesus on the cross, because that is the central teaching of our faith, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and saved us. Also, in a church, you'll see stained glass windows, uh, which will depict different saints and people that we imitate. So they, they don't replace God for us, but their means, their lives, their examples are an example for us as to how we should all live. One thing that's obvious is that there's no chairs. Now, I, we're, we're aware of how Muslims pray, and it's very beautiful, the, the idea of, of physical submission, of bowing, which we do at the beginning of our prayer service, and at occasional services in Judaism, we bow all the way to the ground, with head touching the ground, which you do all the time. But if you wanted to sit and listen to a sermon, it, it, isn't it uncomfortable to just be down? Oh. Well, uh, and what if your legs are bad like mine? <laughs> well, Rabbi, if, uh, in those cases, of course, we have provision in the back of the room or even in the front. People will be sitting in the chair. Oh, good. And do <laughs> just like the kid in school who oh. caused trouble <laughs> I, to the back of the room. I, I need a chair. I need a chair if I'm busy. So those, those, those exceptions are, of course, permissible. But often we get asked, why do you pray this way? Now, the Quran basically says, pray to your creator. The way we pray is de was basically shown by the Prophet. 
Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he prayed, this is the way he prayed. Uh -huh. So we follow his tradition, which is called the Sunnah. The traditions, the sayings, what he did, what he said, and that's why Muslims pray the way they pray. And not having a chair is really, it gives us more space. And, and of course, it, it evens the playing field. That's, yes. that's the most beautiful thing, I think, is that it, everyone is together. Everyone is really and even. I, I really think that's, I'm, I'm ripping out the chairs <laughs> in my synagogue for that. I was so overcome. Mark, you need the chairs. I need the chairs. <laughs> they have plushy chairs. I'm ripping chairs. out their chairs. We I'm Catholics have hard chair. benches. They have plushy chairs. Well, that's Why? A, because my people like to fall asleep during my sermons, and they need the cushy chairs. But the, the architecture of a mosque, um, what variations are there from one to another? A lot of cultural variations. For example? You go to Africa, you'll see the African custom. You go to Turkey, you'll see it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You go to Kashmir, where I grew up, it's a little bit different. Basic concept, core, is the same. Uh, but what might be outside, there would be local variations based on the previous uh, culture of that community. When we return, we'll take one final look at our visit to the mosque, as well as learn about our plans for future episodes of Our Muslim Neighbors. So stay with us. Welcome back. Farouk, what has been the reaction of the Muslim community to doing this show? They are ecstatic. They are so happy to see that a face is being put on the real Muslims who are living in Long Island, and our neighbors will be able to see the real ones. Well, we are very grateful to your leadership in this respect, the students you've sent to help us to make sure we are presenting the Islamic faith in the proper way. We look forward to a long friendship. Absolutely. It's likewise. Let's God continue now with the last look at our visit to the mosque. One of the things that you mentioned was Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is it just that title, is that just given to him or to anyone who has died? All the prophets. All the prophets, basically. Whenever I mention prophet Abraham, prophet Moses, Jesus, David, Noah, all the biblical prophets, uh, we, we basically state all the time, may the Creator bless them and have peace be on them. And that's really, again, not just a Muslim custom. We would have the Hebrew phrase, uh, Allah HaShalom, peace be upon him. And when we would ever say the name of a respected rabbi or a respected teacher or even a family member who we love very much as a sign of love and respect. Whenever we say their name, we would say Allah HaShalom or, or some other phrase like that that is the same thing. When would people come here to gather together as a community to pray? On Friday afternoon. The early afternoon prayer on Friday is set aside for the congregational prayer. And in this mosque in Westbury, we have between five to 700 people show up between one o'clock and two o'clock on Friday to hear the sermon from the uh, Imam uh, who will address the contemporary issues, what's going on in the community, what needs to be done, uh, ask the people to remember the Creator and thank the Creator for all the blessings. And that congregational prayer is from one to two. Now in countries which are predominantly Muslim, it's pretty much a day off. But here, that's part of our lunch hour, our working. And after the prayers are over, we all go back to our activities. Now, in Judaism, we require 10 adults. In Orthodox Judaism, 10 adult men in order to pray. You have no, you have no specific number for prayer, no. and neither do you. Is that no. correct? No, there is no minimum number. So how did the Friday communal prayer come? It, is it a custom? It's, is it required that there be a certain number of people here on Friday? When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, moved from Mecca to Medina and started the community there, he started the process that on Friday afternoons, and there's a Quranic verse which states on Fridays, go out and pray in a congregation, and then after the prayers are over, go back to your work. And he started the tradition, and basically uh, it was his, uh, his initiative which led to the Friday weekly congregation for the Muslims. I think common to all of us is we, we teach that people can pray at home or they can pray any place, but there's a special meaning to prayer when they gather in the mosque, the synagogue, or the church. I know in Catholicism it's expected. I grew up with the idea that I should go to church every Sunday. My dad used to say to me, God gives you 168 hours in the course of a week. Can't you give him back one? Mm -hmm. 
One thing that I notice about the mosque that's obvious is that there's a divider here, and uh, women pray in the back, men pray in the front. That is also true of traditional Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, which divide men and women with a mechitza, a divider in prayer. Um, in your service, they're always together? Men and women are together. Now, in the traditions of liberal Judaism, men and women are together. Are there liberal Islamic traditions where men and women can pray together? At the home, it happens all the time. Family members pray together. In a congregational prayer, for example, on Friday, in every community in the world, you'll see separation of the sexes in the mm -hmm. Muslim tradition. And that comes back to the way we pray. We kneel, we prostrate, we kind of uh, touch the floor, and if I have someone of the opposite sex in yes. front of me, it's a distraction. Of course. Of course. So it's basically to minimize the distraction that the sexes are separated. And in some mosques, they're in the same hall as we have in this mosque. In some, they're in a separate room. And that, that depends on which community uh, one visits. But there's always separation of the sexes during prayers in the Muslim tradition. You mentioned the imam, uh, the, the leader of the community. Is this like a priest or a rabbi? No. In the Muslim tradition, we do not have the hierarchical structure. Uh, imam technically means somebody who leads the prayer. So I could be the imam for this afternoon if I led the prayers. And this is a common misconception out in the general community. And in our community in Westbury, for example, we have uh, Imam Hafiz Ahmad. He is uh, employed by the center. He leads the five congregational prayers, uh, the, the prayers at the mosque. Uh, but he doesn't have the administrative and, uh, and uh, is not the spokesman for the community. And so we have divided up the responsibilities. And in a short answer to your question, uh, Imam is somebody who leads the prayer. The same people who produce God Squad will produce our Muslim neighbors. But one of the things that they lacked and subsequently asked for was someone who could guide them with the knowledge of the Muslim faith. We are joined now by the young woman whose input will be invaluable to the producers of Our Muslim Neighbors. Uh, she's currently enrolled at SUNY Stony Brook, and her name is Rima Siddiqui. Welcome. Thank Welcome, you. Rima. You know Thanks. your name Thank in you. Arabic, which has Hebrew roots, mm -hmm. means the righteous one. That's right. Which would be good. You'd fit in right here with my friend, but not with me. But uh, it's congratulations. Oh, he's Thank much you. better than he admits. <laughs> How, how have you enjoyed uh, being a part of this uh, new series so far? Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I've gotten a chance to work closely with the Muslim community as well, as well as come here and have a platform for us to see, talk about what we feel is important. Um, and just in working with the people, it's, there's been a general sense of gratitude and excitement, immense excitement to finally be able to talk about Muslims in a personal manner, which we don't get to hear too much about. Rima, this is a great spiritual adventure, and thank you for helping to make it possible. We want to thank Dr. Farrah Khan and Rima, and I am Father Tom Hartman. And I am Rabbi Mark Gelman. With the God Squad, God bless you. Welcome, and uh, it's a delight to have you back with the God Squad in one of our most exciting new projects, the exploration of understanding and tolerance with our Muslim neighbors. Tom, this is a Mark, wonderful when thing. When we started 17 years ago, people in the Jewish community were sitting here and the Christian community was sitting here. We wanted to build a bridge. We wanted to encourage you to have the courage to walk across the street and to meet somebody of another faith another culture, another color. Well, now 17 years later, we're expanding our efforts. Our Muslim neighbors represent an outreach to the Muslim community. Many of us don't know enough about the Muslim community, and certainly our topic today, Muslim women. Is it fair? Are they subjugated? Or are they very much uh, blessed and, and taken care of in their respective faith community. Well, it's a very exciting topic, and uh, we're delighted to have with us uh, four Muslim women today. In our first segment, uh, joining us in the studio is Aisha al-Adawiyah.
the founder and director of uh, Women in Islam, and Hoda Spiteri, an accountant and tax consultant uh, here on Long Island. Welcome to both of you. Okay. Tell me something about your organization. Uh, my organization, Women in Islam, is a Muslim women's human rights organization. We were founded in 1992 uh, when the news of the rape camps in Bosnia became headline news. And there was a need then for uh, the American public to have a deep, deeper understanding about what Islam is and who Muslim women are and how does Islam treat Muslim women. At Telecare, I remember al Haj Ghazi Khan Khan calling to our attention the rapes that were going on. We went to Washington and spoke to the people from the Center of Foreign Relations and encouraged them to do something about it because at Telecare we stand for people taking care of each other rather than taking advantage of each other. Tell us about your conversion uh, to Islam. What were you before, and, and how did you come to a new path up the mountain? Mm, yes. Well, uh, I embraced Islam uh, in 1972. I was raised as a Christian, uh, African Methodist Episcopal uh, mm -hmm. community. I was raised in Alabama. Uh, I always think of myself as a spiritual malcontent. So I was on a quest at a very early age. Uh, and uh, when I left my hometown in Alabama uh, to come to New York to pursue a singing career along the path in the early 60s, um, I came into uh, knowledge about uh, Malcolm X, uh, and I was attracted to the social critique of American society at that time. Uh, I did not embrace uh, the Nation of Islam teachings, but I did very much consider him, and I still consider him, a mentor. And it was um, some years after his assassination that I uh, earnestly began to search for a spiritual path to guide my life. And Islam was that um, solution for me. Hoda, one of the images that hits so many of us is the covering of the head. Mm. Can you explain the hijab for us? Well, the Quran tells us to, um, that the believing men and the believing women should be modest and lower their gazes. And this is a, a way of being modest. You know, in mm. churches, in Catholic churches, you always see women with, with veils and, and head coverings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also true in uh, traditional synagogues that women will, will cover their heads right, as well. So this isn't just a Muslim thing mm -hmm. at all. It really is all the Abrahamic faith. The temptation is to think that it's a conservative position, putting women in the corner, mm -hmm. um, letting them not be uh, seen properly. But for you, it's a, a statement of freedom. Absolutely. Um, and on the contrary, um, I'm actually more in the limelight because I tend to be more different than the norm. So I'm bringing more attention to myself by wearing the head covering. Um, and I find it more uh, liberating. Mm -hmm. How about the notion of the role of the Muslim women in society? So many think it's outdated, it's conservative, it's repressive. Your thoughts? Absolutely not. On the contrary. Um, it's very fashionable. <laughs> you know, I spend more time picking out a color coordinating scarf in the morning <laughs> than I do with the average person who just does their hair and runs out the door. Um, it's, it's a, it, it gives me freedom because when I know when someone's speaking with me and they're looking into my eyes, I know they're not looking at my features. They're speaking to me and they're looking to see who I am from inside out mm -hmm. rather than from my beauty or... I agree with that. You know, it was a, it was a choice... Uh for me when, when we were on the pulpit, and, and you have the same issue, you wear robes. Now some liberal rabbis uh, wear just a, a suit coat or a, on the bima and on the, uh, in the pulpit. And I find wearing a robe much more liberating because you're always wearing the same thing. Mm. People aren't looking at what you're wearing that day and they're thinking more about your words. And of course the origin of the head covering was really to minimize the sexual allure of women to men who were not their husbands. Now, in, in the case of the head covering, does it happen that you have to put it on when you're married, or do you have to put it on as soon as you go in public? Once you hit puberty, you should wear it. I see. Um, because that's when you're coming to age. 
Right. And that's when your beauty starts to allure sure. other, the opposite sex. So now um, there's, there's different words. Let's get it straight what it is. We've called this a hijab. Mm -hmm. Is that pronounced correctly? Correctly. Here, mm -hmm. Hijab. Now hijab is basically a scarf yes. that you would wear over your head and, and around your neck and, and sort of over your shoulders. Is yes, that? to cover the bosom area. I see. Mm -hmm. And um, then, but I've also heard of two other words, the chador and the nakab. Uh, what are those? The shador is a, um, an oversized hijab that you would bring over your head and bring it around. So it would be more of a, a covering. And right? a, nakab, yeah. a nakab is what? Let me just and clear that And a nakab that. is when they just cover from oh, here. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. They, that's they bring the, the scarf across and they only show the eyes. Got it. Only the eyes are shown. How does the Islamic faith empower women? Well, I think that uh, my own personal example is one. Um, I think that uh, historically, uh, Islam uh, spoke to the issues of rights of women uh, at a time when uh, there was a tremendous void in other faith traditions. Uh, so I, I, I believe that we took the lead in many respects in addressing some of the fundamental rights of, of, of women in general. For example? For example, uh, there are laws <laughs> of uh, inheritance. So that uh, a man can't just throw a wife out and, and she would have nothing? Well, uh, according to Islamic law, he can't, although culturally those things happen. Yes. Uh, the inheritance laws, even divorce laws, and many of the the right to an education, uh, the right to be married, uh, the right to have children, uh, the right to sexual gratification even, mm -hmm. you see. So these are some powerful concepts. And we have the same traditions in, in, our, in our legal tradition as well, empowering women. How have certain interpretations of the Quran affected the view of women? In the Quran, for example, one gets the impression that women are secondary people. They cannot participate equally with men in conversations and, and their, their role is basically to be at home, is the impression that many of us have. Well, unfortunately, those are some of the cultural practices that proliferate uh, in the uh, Muslim world, uh, which is one of the reasons why we encourage in our organization uh, Muslim women to learn uh, what Islamic law actually is, so that through their own knowledge they empower themselves and uh, future generations. Um, what Islam about polygamy? Uh, that's polygyny. A polygyny. Yes. Having many wives. It's a lawful practice in Islam. Yes, I know. Also in Hebrew, and I think in well, the actually church not. tradition as well. It is. It is. Uh, it was uh, eliminated for all European Jews back in mm. the Middle Ages, mm. and it is eliminated in Israeli law, mm. so mm. you can't have more than one wife. Mm. So basically, it's eliminated. Well, traditionally, I think if we go back to the traditional sources, these were practices that were legitimate. Right, and that's the key point mm. of my question. Mm. Judaism changed. Mm. Mm. It was mm. once. It once allowed many wives, but then it changed. Is there a force within Islam that you hope will change uh, f to, to simple monogamy? Well, may I just answer the question about yeah. whether or not polygyny is lawful in oh. Islam, and it is lawful That's in That's what Islam. you said, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. There are some conditions in order to uh, participate in that practice, uh, and that requires a long discussion. Uh, there are also uh, 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 items that uh, ha empower a woman to uh, participate in a decision as to whether or not she would live in polygamy yes, or polygyny. Yes, she has the right to divorce this if is she called, cannot. Well, mm -hmm. this, uh, this is called a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in Western society, we refer to it as a prenuptial agreement. But this is something that Muslims have been pr practicing. But you're comfortable with polygyny. Centuries. But there's I a am, wisdom behind it, I Rabbi am comfortable. And then we'll get your view. I'm okay. comfortable in what the fundamental teachings of Islam are. I think the challenge to us is to understand what, in fact, are those teachings. But not to change them. Uh, no, I think that we need to understand what they are. And if we believe that God is just and fundamentally good, mm. God would not impose things on us that are oppressive. What, what is your view about That's polygyny? That's a beautiful statement. Um, well, it, it's acceptable by me because there's conditions for it. One being if you're married and your wife is barren. My husband has the right to have children. So you can adopt children. Well, yes, but then they cannot take your name. Islamically, they cannot take your name. They need to know that they're Can't adopted. Can't they be converted? 
well, and then take your... No, you actually, the teachings of Islam say if you adopt, let's say, a Jewish child, you need to let him know that he is Jewish, but we are Muslim. Now it will be up to him to embrace Islam, or he or she. Hmm. Um, there is no compulsion in religion. I cannot impose a religion on top over someone. I'd like to thank um, Aisha and Hoda for taking the time out to join us. You both shared some unique perspectives that were very enlightening to all of us today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Today, Rabbi Gilman and I are learning about the roles of women in Islam. Joining us now to provide more insight into Islamic women's role are Dr. Arfa Khan, Professor of Radiology at Albert Einstein School of Medicine, and Peggy uh, Iamuno, uh, the mother of two and currently pursuing her master's degree at SUNY Empire State College, Welcome, Peggy. Thank you. Welcome to both of you. Dr. Khan, medicine is important in every um, religion, the healing process and that. Are there ever any conflicts that you have between your role as doctor and, and your role as healer in the hospital? Um, absolutely not. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, there is an oath, Hippocratic oath for doctors, and there is an Islamic oath for doctors. And it's very similar, as a matter of fact, in the Islamic Oath, there is more compassion and more respect for the life of the patient. Peggy, you converted to Islam. That's right. Uh, as did uh, uh, Aisha. Aisha. And uh, could you just tell us first about the experience of your conversion? What sure. What brought it about? Sure, it'd be my pleasure. My um, my husband and I were married for about six years. Your husband is from? He, my, my husband is Egyptian, and he was raised in Egypt. He's been here about 22 years, and he was raised in a Muslim country. Uh, we married. Uh, we never had the conversation about converting, but when my daughter was about three, I really valued my growing up with a religious teaching. I was raised as a Christian and I knew it gave me a sense of comfort to know that God was there. But I wasn't a practicing uh, Catholic. Actually I wasn't practicing any faith and I had really lost my um, path to God. So I didn't want to be a duplicitous and say to my husband, uh, uh, let's raise our daughter Christian when he was Muslim. So I said, if I read the Quran and if I find nothing objectionable, we will raise her uh, as Muslim, never imagining that I would convert to Islam. So I read the Quran, and for, my, for me, my experience was just immediate uh, guidance and relief and light. That's wonderful. Alhamdulillah, praise God. Yeah, that's wonderful. Tell me, Dr. Khan, uh, you grew up in Kashmir. Yes. How is life different for a woman, for a woman in Kashmir as opposed to the United States? Well, there are different aspects of life. You know, uh, there's spiritual life, there's political life, there's social life. And uh, a spiritual life is no different. Uh, political life, uh, the women in Kashmir are, um, they hold offices in the politics and they have freedom to do that. And a social life, uh, if it is um, uh, followed according to the uh, Quran, uh, where the woman is very respected and taken care of, uh, by husband, by father, by brother, uh, it's the same. The only thing which was a different was uh, in Kashmir, I was a, in the majority religion. Muslim is a majority religion. When I came to America at age 22, uh, I found myself that I was in the minority. And it was, for a while, it was difficult to adjust. And one thing struck me right away that how much uh, non-Muslims were ignorant about Islam. Of course, and that's why we're doing this program. Right. And do you believe there's this conflict between Islam and modern feminist ideology? Uh, Peggy, why don't you begin? Yeah. Sure. With respect to whether anything is at variance in Islam to equality and women's rights and whether there needs to be reform or uh, different denominations, I would say in my view the answer would be no because ultimately in all of the signs and ayahs and verses of the Quran we are taught that despite which nation and tribe God created you from, despite what gender you are, in the end the only thing you'll be judged for is your righteousness. That is the leveling force. Your submission to God, your duty to family and uh, community is the first criteria. So I, I definitely don't see a subordinate role at all to women. I do see separate roles for women and men, 
uh, in many ways, and some of them can kind of weave together, and others of them don't. But I value my role as uh, in my first to God, and then to my husband and my children, and then I, I praise God that often I can take on other roles in my community, in my school, in my career. Uh, I don't see any of it at variance with um, women's rights uh, or with uh, feminism at all. Is there any one stereotype about the Muslim women that you would like to dispel? Um, I would like to talk about hijab because uh, I get asked a lot of time, you know, how come you don't wear hijab? And I did a lot of research about it. When I grew up in Kashmir, I didn't wear hijab. My mother didn't wear hijab, my sister didn't wear hijab. And that comes from the custom and the culture. Um, hijab, as Peggy mentioned, in Quran it says that the uh, believing men have to lower their gaze and the believing women have to lower their gaze and they both have to be modest. And then there is one sentence that says that the women should cover, uh, uh, should cover their bosoms with their hat scarf. And that's the line which is, there are two opinions. Uh, one opinion is that it says it, use your head cover, cover to cover your bosom, so that's why you should cover your head. And the other is that it means that you don't, it doesn't mean anything about head cover, it just says you should cover your bosom. Mm -hmm. Peggy, what, what do you believe are the stereotypes you'd like to correct? Well, I think for me that Islam is an exotic religion, uh, that it's for folks from foreign lands who are not Western or advanced, because Western we often equate with more advanced, uh, you know, civilization, community. And I would say that all of the teachings of Islam allow me to, you know, hopefully promote pluralism, empathy, and community, and grow our knowing of each other. It's a duty in Islam to know each other and for others to know us. So I would say the stereotype of it being, you know, a vacuum where we just kind of are only with our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters and where we don't open up or we don't want to let people in, that's a stereotype that right. I would love to see uh, banished. It almost always happens that when a new group of people come into this country, yes. they stick with themselves. Yes. And it takes a long time to build bridges to other communities. Yes. How do you see as a woman in the Islamic community that uh, experience? Do you find that women in the Islamic community go beyond the Muslim community? Absolutely. Uh, w w I see it a lot because I work with women inside my community and outside my community. We're all Girl Scout leaders. We're all in our uh, children's schools volunteering in the PTA. We're very much reaching out and we lead with our faith uh, in a lot of times. Just like all women that I'm uh, volunteering with it, whether they're Muslim or not, they seem to always lead with their faith, lead with their family, lead with their community. I definitely see a lot of reaching out by my uh, Muslim women. We, personally, I know of maybe, I can name five or six different interfaith initiatives that the Islamic Center of Long Island, which is a very diverse community of yes, Muslims, indeed. is involved in. And for me, that's the benchmark. For me, that says we're practicing our faith, and we're participating outside of our faith community because we must, because it's our duty. I want to ask both of you the question we asked in the first segment because it in some ways is the, the central question. What's your view about uh, polygyny? Well, the way I see it is it certainly is in the Quran as permissible. And of course, as the women in the other segment said, there are conditions by which it's allowable. When I read this, I'll be very frank with you, I read this in the Quran and I I pray to God to help me be ready to understand this teaching. Not every line of any of our scripture, of we can understand completely what God's intention was. So I'm certainly not going to judge. Uh, I have to trust our Creator, the source of mercy and kindness, that there is a good reason for this. But I will tell you, uh, it's certainly not actively, uh, you know, something that any man I know has ever participated in, and I'm part of a large Muslim community. Well, because it's illegal. Well, it's illegal, but you know what? Uh, I know people from other countries where it's not illegal. I'm, I'm connected with Muslim countries in many ways because of my friends and family. But it's very prevalent in other countries. Well, not in my circle. So I oh, think okay. once you start, um, if, if we're seeking knowledge and educating ourselves and moving towards uh, certain conditions of lifestyle, you tend to eliminate that allowance. So I think some of the conditions that the other women were referring to have to do with literally you must treat every wife equally and each wife mm -hmm. need, needs to agree to the condition. So if, if tomorrow my husband said I'm Muslim and I would like to have a second wife, I could say to him, very good for you and we won't be married anymore, that's my right. 
So it, it's, it is a, uh, an allow, about allowable uh, tradition, pardon me, in Islam, but something that I personally would not uh, be okay with. When we return, we'll take one final look at the role of women in Islam. So stay with us for more of Our Muslim Neighbors. Welcome back with uh, Arfa Peggy, Aisha, and Hoda. We see tremendous, tremendous, an obvious uh, variation and diversity and the beauty of the, the different traditions uh, of how you have all chosen to teach the same teaching of Islam Mark, in this world. I know you're proud of Judaism. I'm proud of Christianity. And we come here as believers in our religion. Can you share with us in our audience one reason why you're proud to be a Muslim? One of the reasons is just what we see here, the diversity and the pluralism. Uh, God speaks to us and asks us through the Quran to embrace that pluralism, equality, and uh, our duty to each other in our own ummah, our own religious community, and outside of our co community. That's why I'm most proud of being Muslim. Thank you, Peggy. Thank That's you. Wonderful. Yeah, um, the reason that I chose Islam uh, is that I found that it was a vehicle uh, to drive my life in the most positive way, and that when I do that, based on the true understanding of what the fundamental teachings of the religion are. I not only empower myself, my family, but also impact people around me. And that's the ultimate contribution uh, to civil society. Dr. Thank Khan. you. Well, I was born a Muslim, and I chose to remain a Muslim because to is Islam is a religion of peace and friendliness. And there is a dial direct dialogue with the God. There's nobody in between. So it gives me peace in my heart. Besides being born into the faith of Islam, um, I really consider myself really becoming Muslim when I was in college, uh, when I was searching, God searching, and looking for the, the path to follow. And what brought me nearer to Islam was that we believed in the three Abrahamic faiths. I believe in Moses, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in Muhammad. And that gave me an inner peace and security in my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a, a wonderful thing to be able to see many ways up the same mountain, Tom. It's a wonderful thing to see the many ways that God has revealed truth to all people. And the fact that we're sitting down from different religions, listening to each other, embracing each other, and appreciating each other. And most of all, eating the honey cake of each other. Now, now what, it always comes back to food, what, folks. What, what, is, what do we, ha we have here? Wait till he brings in some Jewish food. I just wanted to say you, you, you might become it. Jewish. It looks like cornbread, but this simple. is so much better than it's cornbread. It's Basbusa. It's a honey cake made with a wheat farina and yogurt and lots of sugar and butter. Basbusa. <laughs> Basbusa. It's a traditional this. Middle Eastern Egyptian This dish. could have made the difference for me. <laughs> this, is, this is better than a knish. He's, he's, this is much better than a knish. He's used to Darling, would you like a piece of your own food? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. God bless you God all, bless and you. Uh, you may God you. help us to Thank find each other. Thank you We have. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Dr. Khan, Aisha, Peggy, Hoda, God bless you all. Be with us next Thank time you. for Our Thank Muslim you. Neighbors. <laughs>